Hi everyone, and welcome to this talk about infrastructure drift, infrastructure as code, DevSecOps, and well, drift control. All right, the agenda. Uh, so in this talk, I will briefly define what is infrastructure drift, what we learned the hard way, and then it will be fun live demos and stories uh, from the trenches. This will be a very uh, hands-on talk. Thank you for attending. So basically, last year, uh, we were working on the GitOps platform to support infrastructure as code and all the tooling, the best practices, etc. And at some point, we looked for feedback to build the next features. And we interviewed our users and other DevOps, SREs, CTOs, etc. And the most important pain those people reported uh, was around infrastructure drift visibility of what's living outside of your Terraform configuration. So if you have only one thing to remember from this talk, it's that almost everyone experienced infrastructure drift recently and that drifts can have major consequences, including security. In the end, that's the reason uh, why we built this open source tool called Drift Control, Drift Cuddle, Drift CTL. It's up to you. Choose your poison. So I'm Stefan Jordan, as Jordan pretty much everywhere on, on the internet. I've been around infrastructures for the past 20 years. I co-founded a bunch of companies in Canada and Europe. And well, many years ago, I, I co-wrote this book, Infrastructure as Code Cookbook. And more recently, I'm the happy co-founder of the open source tool Drift Control with a wonderful team. So after talking to hundreds of people, we had to come up with a common definition of infrastructure drift. And basically it's what happens when the reality and the expectations don't match. It's also known as, oh my God, when things go wrong while they really should not. So according to this definition, your AWS account has a ton of actual resources that's on the right, and maybe only part of it is correctly managed by Terraform that's on the left. And the diff is, the drift. So what are the causes of the drift? There are many, but the major ones are the manual changes directly on the AWS console, the authenticated lambdas or microservices, you know, the scripts that you run every night, I don't know, to snapshot those disks on AWS or scan for certain tags, etc. It can be also this other team uh, working with this other tool or that AWS service not yet available in the current Terraform provider version that you are using. Maybe it's just that new project starting on this new cloud provider. It's different from the current one and no time to automate it properly. All those activities and others are authenticated and are sources, causes of drift. So it could be no big deal. And maybe we could all live with those drifts. Problem is, misconfiguration can lead to security issues you don't even know about. And we see here on this picture that the NSA recently leveled uh, poor access control and misconfiguration as top issues. And definitely you want to know about the unknown stuff running in your cloud provider accounts. As we just said, we definitely need to shed some light on the unknown resources of your accounts, those that are not under control uh, with Terraform. And only then, you'll know about misconfiguration. Only then you will be able to address or fix the issues. Now it's time for the stories, for the fun part, the live part. Uh, I will share um, so a few stories. They are simplified for the talk. They are from our uh, closed environment. And uh, I'll show as well how our uh, open source answer, uh, Drift Control, uh, helped in this case to, to find uh, vulnerabilities in a configuration. So the first story is about this authenticated microservice for the Lambda actually. And basically during the weekend, um, there was a problem. Uh, it was just deployed, things like that. And basically, uh, let me switch. Here we are. And basically what the, the on-call uh, guys did uh, that weekend was going to the microservice IAM user and basically they said, oh, maybe it's uh, a problem uh, with the credentials. So let's deactivate the first one and create a new access key. So at last we will try that. Unfortunately, uh, it did not help. So they said, okay, maybe, maybe it's this policy read-only is not enough. Let's try again and attach a larger one uh, uh, policy. So uh, it wasn't administrative access, uh, actually, but uh, it, it's it's quicker. Imagine what can go wrong. 
And basically, we don't know what happened, but a few minutes later, uh, it started to work again. And they said, okay, uh, we're, we're good with that. We will uh, report it back on Monday uh, to the team and we'll be good. So what happened is that they forgot to report it back on Monday, uh, as you can imagine, and it stood that way uh, for a long time. But it was cool. They had uh, everything on Terraform. So as you can see here on, um, and the code is working. So um, this is a basic Terraform code. If you're not used to it, it basically means that you, you create three resources. One is a user, one is an access key, and the other one is an attachment for a policy, a managed policy, a read-only one. So basically it will create a, uh, an, a user, a microservice user, an IAM user with a, a dedicated access key for this specific user and a, a, a policy attachment which is the read-only access uh, you wanted. And basically, this uh, configuration was perfectly well working on Terraform. And if you applied Terraform here, Terraform apply, well, it didn't see the change because Terraform is meant to see only changes for its scope. And basically a new attachment in this case is seen as a new resource, as a new object. It cannot see that there is a new attachment. It's not meant for that. So had our team used uh, drift control here, it would have done the following result. It's scanning the AWS account and comparing the results with the Terraform state. So in this case, we have for the three stories uh, I'm going to tell you, we have three states for IAM users, uh, VPC security groups, and S3 buckets. We can see here that we scanned uh, 59 resources uh, on the account and that Drift Control uh, found resources not covered by Terraform like this access key that we just created. And this is, it, it, it belongs to uh, the user, the IAM user microservice LHZ something. We also uh, display some uh, information like the number of resources, percentage coverage uh, of your Terraform code compared to what's on your AWS account, etc. So that's the kind of things Terraform can miss by design on, on CI. And that's the kind of things Drift Control can uh, show you live if you use it. So this is the first story for this, uh, this example. Uh, the second one is about security groups. Uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, people started working from home and in this team, a couple of people couldn't connect uh, to the company network and they didn't want to wait for IT to solve the issue. They asked some managers to do something and one of them had enough credentials to open up everything to everyone and basically it solved the issue. And you'll see, so how does it look like? Um, VPC, no, here we are. Main. So this is a security group. It's called super secure because it only allows port 22 SSH for the local network on AWS. So basically it's completely locked down. Um, so if you go, if you go there, definitely we are good. So what did the team do in this case? The guy went to the security group in the console. He edited inbound rules. And basically what he did was adding a rule, all traffic from anywhere on IPv6, IPv4, and called it temp. So that he was sure he's gonna remember it. All right, so now you have all your rules here and the Terraform was on CI, it was running every hour or so, and at the next Terraform apply, maybe two hours later, uh, what happened? Do you think it would be reported as a new rule in the managed security group? Unfortunately, not, because same story, it's not the same thing as seen on AWS, a rule seems like to be 
two objects to two elements of a single table array but it's not the case at all on terraform the way it was written here on terraform it means that basically here if we look again this here it doesn't mean that adding an element to the array would be seen by terraform it's a different object once again so basically we needed a tool like um driftctl to to show this team the drifts they had on their account so here now this team would have a security group rule discovered as unmanaged not covered by terraform and they would have had the whole information like the ipv6 addresses source addresses ipv4 the name the id of the security group the type and they would have seen as well that their coverage went down it went from uh how many it was how much it was it was 85 percent and now it's 66 percent so it went down heavily so basically that's about it for um, the security group story if you add rules manually on the web console for aws and you wrote your rules that way on terraform you will never see added rules using terraform you need to use a specific tool for that so unfortunately for them nobody reported uh, the change on the weeks after that and the security group uh, stood open for a very long time so the third and final story for this talk is the aws s3 terrible story that a team in the uk in london reported to me a few months ago they were building a, a plugin uh, there were like a hundred developers and every hour or so uh, they were uploading to s3 a build of this a temporary build of this plugin and it was uh, then processed by qa test etc and then dropped because it was useless at the time just holy testing of everything so it, it was uh, hundreds of gigabytes every day uploaded and processed and dropped um, at some point there was another team in another country um, they wanted to improve security and compliance in in in, in the company and they went to see them and, and tell them well uh, we will enable redundancy uh in in versioning sorry in in s3 so we will do it on on your bucket as well so the team I was talking to uh, told them, well, it's perfectly useless in our case. It's cool for, for the others, but it's useless in our case because it will cost a lot because we definitely don't care about what we uh, upload on S3. If it burns, uh, we don't care. We will have lost one hour of work. It's not, it's not an issue. So the other team said, okay, cool. You mentioned that, so we will not enable S3 versioning uh, on your bucket. They went home. Everybody was happy uh, because the first team... Uh, thought well anyway if they make a mistake we have everything on, on terraform and if they change a setting uh, we will know about it because uh, as you can see here the resource is pretty simple and the bucket is declared so we will know if they change something so no no problem with that and the other team was happy as well because they scripted a wonderful script with a lot of exceptions for all the buckets etc and if it failed uh, they will know about it as well they executed the script it enabled versioning everywhere and absolutely everywhere because uh, their exception didn't work but they didn't know about it and they went on with their lives and guess what happens at the first uh, week of every uh, month it's um, the AWS bill so what happened in their case uh, so this is the the bucket and basically the script did something like um, enable here uh, versioning so it was not on the web console but it's the same id so they enabled versioning and and now and now drift control would see here a changed resource so the the aws s3 bucket conf 42 demo whatever has versioning enabled from false to true if we go to s3 folder you can see here and we terraform apply it refreshes from aws it will not report the change and even worse some way it's not worse it's meant for that but if we look for 
the S3 bucket here, we will see that versioning is enabled directly on the state. So that's something that was written on the state while not um, while not uh, expressed in directly on the resource. So, so basically, this uh, kind of mistake can cost a lot as well. It's not a security issue in this case, but it can cost a lot to the company because it was definitely not meant to be enabled uh, for Wix. This is uh, a few examples from real life, but real life also includes um, different ways of managing that kind of drifts. And if you want to integrate uh, the data uh, drift control um, reports with another tool, maybe you can, maybe you want to store the data in a database for dashboards, uh, for tracking, for integration in reports, uh, etc. So you can use the JSON output for, from uh, Drift Control. Let me show that uh, to you. You can just add uh, the output here, uh, JSON output.json, sorry. And basically, oh yeah, I'm not on the right folder. And here we are. Okay, same output. And now if we take a look at output.json, we have we have the same output uh, that we had previously, uh, but now as JSON. Uh, what can what's the use for that? Maybe you want to only keep the coverage uh, output, so you can just graph percentage uh, directly on your directly. I don't know on the dashboard or, or something. Uh, maybe on on the pull request kind of things. So you can use JQ to parse um, the output and well. Do whatever you want with it after that. That's it for the JSON output. There is a lot of filters. Uh, if you want to report only a certain type of resources, only a certain tag, anything specific to your case, uh, you can do it with Drift Control filters. It's using uh, the GemsPath query language. It's very useful to analyze and report uh, on specific cases. This example here is about um, security group rules. It's uh, it's not bad. It's a good um, it's a good example in our case. So it's uh, filter type equal AWS security group rule and let's go. So the tool will report only on AWS security group rules and not not the other resources. You can see here that the coverage dropped dramatically because we have so many drifts in security group rules that the coverage is now very, very low. So yeah, filters are really, really useful you know, on, on drift control to control to report on, on specific areas, even for enumeration uh, or regular audits as well. So um, there is also this uh, drift ignore file because you will probably start uh, with a lot of unmanaged resources in your uh, AWS account. I have a lot of mess, a lot of test files, and you probably do as well. Even by just testing things on, on AWS, it creates a lot of sub resources uh, that are not uh, clean afterwards. So drift control has support for this file dot Drift ignore. Uh, it's pretty much like the git ignore file that you already know. It takes a resource type, so like in this case, AWS IAM user, and a name or an ID. So it's Terraform in this case because it's the first user that I created manually on, on the AWS console. So it's AWS IAM user dot Terraform, but it can be an ID as well for a security group, etc. So you can ignore specific resources uh, while you work on it, while you, I don't know, you, you import it on your um, Terraform code while you maybe will uh, remove it from your account. At least you can start fresh or you can work on it at your pace. So when it's included in your drift ignore file, it will be ignored. That's the name of the file. And you can also add this file to your own Docker image. So if you include, if you work with your own Docker image, we have a cloudscape slash drift CTL image available official image and you can start from there uh, to add your own drift ignore so you are uh, perfectly ready to to launch uh, drift control with the ignore file uh, i don't know uh, as a, a scheduled job on uh, on on kubernetes for example 
Finally, once uh, you have your initial reports cleaned, you can deploy drift control in your um, CI pipeline, at least as a recurring task, uh, cron job, etc. Um, like, uh, well, every hour or so, if your infrastructure is not too big. So yeah, so you can get alerts uh, when something goes wrong in the hover. Um, I've seen different use cases using drift control. So one of them is that after Terraform apply is executed on the pipeline. A lot of other scripts are executed. Uh, stuff are done uh, after Terraform apply in the pipeline. And to ensure those scripts and stuff don't create a mess, people execute a drift control after um, Terraform apply and the rest of the pipeline in the end. That's one use case. Another use case is the exact opposite, the other way around. People want to ensure that the situation is perfectly under control before doing anything with Terraform uh, involving apply and like using drift control like a safety check uh, before Terraform apply can change anything on the state. Remember um, the Terraform, uh, the, the TF state uh, a few minutes ago uh, that was modified because of the Terraform refresh. It's the job of the of Terraform refresh to do this. Uh, but if you do not want this to happen in your case, well, put drift control first in your pipeline. So you can put it at the end if you want to ensure things are okay in or at the beginning if you want to ensure uh, things are under control before executing Terraform apply. You can use it uh, in parallel with Terraform plan as well because they do different things, one uh, from the Terraform scope and the other from outside the scope uh, of Terraform. In any case, I strongly advise uh, you to deploy um, drift control like an holy check so you can get reports if anything uh, changes. So um, yeah, basically uh, that's about it. Um, Drift Control is uh, written in Go. It's a brand new tool. It was released last December, early January. It's written in Go. The, uh, the license is Apache 2. Uh, it has support for AWS and GitHub. More is to come. You can go on GitHub discussion, upvote for the next cloud provider because we are really community driven. So if you want Azure or DigitalOcean or GCP or I don't know what cloud provider, go vote for it because that's where uh, we're going to decide uh, what's the next uh, cloud provider to support. Uh, we support today the Terraform state uh, locally, S3, HTTP, uh, cloud, Terraform cloud is coming very soon. Basically, same way, same situation. If you want to vote for other features like reading the Terraform state, go vote on GitHub, uh, GitHub discussion. There's a lot of discussions about that. Filtering, ignore, I showed them in the slides. We are also very, very present, uh, very active on, on Discord. You can go to drift control, driftctl.com slash D. It's uh, a shortcut that um, redirects you to um, um, this, to our Discord, community Discord. We are there, you, we can uh, answer all your questions live. We can help you live uh, there as well. So. If you joined uh, during the talk, uh, what to remember is that almost everyone uh, is experiencing uh, infrastructure drift and that we basically built uh, drift control as an open source tool to increase uh, the knowledge and security of automated cloud infrastructures. So yeah, thanks for watching and see you soon on, on Discord and on GitHub. Thank you, bye.